He's, uh, I guess he's playing trumpet or something. He's blowing his horn. He's tooting his horn again. It upsets me a little bit because if the reeds are gone, I will, I'll never make it to the end. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so sorry. Hey, Chris, it gives you something to look for. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I can't go. We're just getting into a good part of it. I'll get to ask God himself. Yeah. He'll have to fix everything I messed up. Now, Jeff wasn't quite right on that one. He thought he knew what he was talking about, but he's just silly. <laughs> All right. Well, we are on session 42 out of 42 sessions. So we're moving right along. Still in the flood, still on Genesis chapter 6 in the first four verses. I think we've been there for the past three sessions. So, <clears throat> All right. Uh, oh, yeah, last week we talked about heresies and stuff like that, so that's why we've got this here. We're now back on track. Getting to the daughters of men. This is, uh, of course, they said the sons of God saw the daughters of men and took them as wives they chose. And we talked about how the sons of God, some people took the theory that this was the line of Seth and the daughters were the line of Cain. And so we're going to kind of just look at some of the stuff surrounding the daughters of men just to make sure we understand that it is daughters of men and it's not some segmented group or population. Uh, of course, when men began to multiply, the, the word there in Hebrew is Adam, for Adam, uh, referring to mankind. It's not referring to a segment of mankind, uh, not a special line. And of course, it says daughters were born unto them. The Hebrew word there is bath. Uh, it's used over 500 times, and every time it's referred to as a daughter and just nothing else. Uh, these were not a segment of daughters born to a segment of men. They were just normal daughters born to normal men. But we kind of covered that quite a bit. Uh, again, referring to the angels that uh, saw the women, it says, uh, the sons of God saw. The word saw there meaning to look upon, seek, regard, look after, to watch. Uh, they were watching them. They were keeping their eye on them. And that's the, the original uh, calling of the watchers was to watch over mankind. Uh, I'm not really, it doesn't get real clear in scripture as what their whole duties were. Uh, you know, there's other kinds of angels. There's, uh, let's see, cherubim. I think there was, there are four cherubim that surround, there's a four cherubim that surround the throne. Uh, Satan himself was an anointed cherub. So that's why some people think there was initially five cherub. Then there's seraphim. There's uh, archangels like Michael. Uh, there's even guardian angels. Uh, I don't know if it exactly spells out as guardian angels, but it, it talks about. Oh, I have to. I should have looked that up before Wouldn't I said guardian that. Guardian angels be watchers. It could be. Yeah, that, that could be. But apparently, there's just like a multitude of heavenly hosts that, and each one of them have certain callings and certain duties. Gabriel was a messenger for the Lord. Uh, he seemed to oftentimes. Uh, of course, he came with. Let's see. He came with to see Mary. Uh, I think he came to see, was it the parents of Samson? I'm trying to think the other times. But each, of course, each one of them has a duty. And I remember one time uh, when we were kind of young in our faith, uh, we were talking to our pastor. He had come over to do like a counseling session with us, uh, to talk with us and stuff. And, and he was talking about how many angels there are in, the, in, in God's kingdom. And my wife was like, why does he need so many angels? That's a little narcissistic, isn't it? <laughs> and he he kind of looked at us like, huh? <laughs> and uh, he said, "Well, he's God. He can have as many as he wants." So, but uh, these are the sons of God. They were looking upon women. Like I said before, the Book of Enoch refers to them as watchers, and uh, they uh, they're actually mentioned in the Book of Daniel three times, and it's in Daniel chapter four. And Daniel chapter four is the one of the <clears throat> is the one chapter uh, I think there's a, another one also in the Old Testament it's one of the one chapters that is, is all in Aramaic uh, Aramaic is the close kind of like a close cousin to Hebrew and it's the letter from Nebuchadnezzar talking about a dream he had and then Daniel had come to interpret it and the interpretation was is that um, uh, Nebuchadnezzar thought himself highly of himself thought he was the one who, ro who raised up his kingdom he was the one who had built it, and the Lord had pretty much smited him and made him one of the beasts of the field uh, because he did not acknowledge the Lord as the one who raises up kingdoms in, in, among men. 
and he was that way for seven years and there's uh, belief that uh, in the Babylonian Talmud and some other ancient literature that Daniel was the one who actually took care of him while he in essence went mad uh, he said his hair grew as eagle's feathers and his uh, his nails as, as thick as eagle's claws or something like that and he was like that way for seven years and some pe people think he went mad and other people think he actually was transfigured as a beast of the field for seven years to because he didn't acknowledge the Lord but it's in this chapter here that it's mentioned three times that so the watchers had come down and had given this message uh, to the king so they are mentioned in the Bible um, but of course like I said these angels took it upon themselves to do a little bit more than just watch over mankind or guard over mankind <clears throat> it says that they were fair uh, they were good and pleasing to look upon that the women were beautiful some more modern wording could be voluptuous, vivacious, effervescent, salacious, fine, hot, and fat. You ever heard of that term? No. Pretty hot and tempting. Okay. <laughs> yeah, usually if you call a woman fat, that, that go over, you're not really sure what. You're not sure if you're going to live until tomorrow. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so. But apparently the women were, to them, were very beautiful. And there's a place in the New Testament, I, I, I have to look it up, but Paul commends the women to cover their heads, he says, because the angels are watching. And a lot of the commentary I've read actually harkens back to this issue that was going on back then. So as to not lead, help to allow the, to not let the angels go astray. Is that why the uh, people that believe in Muhammad, they throw themselves up and them? So the men cannot look up on them? Yeah, so that the men cannot look upon the women. I'm thinking back down from this. Could be. Yeah, because it's only that the man, the husband. Actually, have, have you, do you guys watch TLC? Uh, they've got this that one show called Sister Wives about the polygamous, polygamous family. They have another one uh, called uh, All American Muslim. And it's about Ameri Muslims that are born in America. And they, you know, up in Dearborn, Michigan. And I was watching it one day, and they were talking about why the women cover their head. They said that it's only for the husband and a non, and a man that cannot marry her that can look upon her hair. So her husband could look upon her hair, her children could look upon her hair, her father, her father-in-law, but nobody else, because that's exclusively for the man and nobody else to look at. <clears throat> so. But yeah, they and when they reach a certain age, I think it's the age of nine, they have to put on the whatever that thing's called to cover their hair. So. Uh, but it also says that they took them, and the word there that took is it refers to as possibly by force. Uh, but there are other ancient texts that say that the gods were irresistible to human women, and some women willfully went with this. So it's kind of hard <coughs> to tell if they were taken by force, if they or if they willfully went along. Going on, it says, Genesis 6, 3, And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he is also flesh. And if we, uh, or the word strive there means to judge, contend, or plead. And the Lord, the Lord is patient, of course, you know. He's long-suffering, as it says. Uh, we talked before about the name Methuselah. His name means his death shall bring. And Methuselah is the, the oldest living man that had died. And his name was a representation of the coming judgment. But his, his age represented God's long-suffering. And of course, the, the Bible says that God is willing that no man should perish, but all come to repentance. So God is willing to take a long time to wait for somebody to come and repent. But there does come a point where God will say, enough. And uh, of course, in this scripture, it says that he will not always strive with men. God, will, God does have a limit. It's a pretty big limit. <laughs> But it, there is a limit where he'll finally say, enough. I've called you, I've pleaded with you, I have tried to get you to repent of your sins, but you're not listening to me. And also, uh, God asks us to do pretty much the same thing. Uh, like, for example, in Matthew 18, 15 through 17, uh, this is <clears throat> where Jesus is talking about how to attempt to get a brother to reconcile back into the church. If, if a brother offends you, you go and you talk to him. If he doesn't want to listen to you, you take another brother. If he doesn't want to listen to you, then you take him to the church. If he doesn't want to listen to the church, you turn him out and you treat him like a heathen and a publican. Not for the part of just getting him out of the church, but for the hope that he'll repent and come back. And also the same thing in Mark 6, 11 and some other places. Uh, 
the Lord told the man that you go to a town, you find a man of peace, you let your peace rest upon that house. If they receive you, you stay and you preach. But if they do not receive you, then you go to the edge of the town, shake the dust off your feet as a testimony that you tried, but they didn't listen. So the Lord is always willing to call, but if you're not going to listen, there will come a point where he'll say, that's enough. And uh, sometimes... Do yes. you know of a, of a situation where you've been a part of that, where that third step of the process will never, never happen? Yeah. You never Mine happened at... Uh, I mean, it's, best, it's mainly with a pastor or something, right? Yeah, yeah. and that was my incident. But, no, this was a brother. This was a brother um, uh, walked off from his marriage, uh, seeing another woman uh, still living still living in, in, and had his business in, the, in, in, in their communal home um, and would come back in the weekends and run his business out of the home. And then during the week we'd go spend time with his mistress in the uh, the church. Uh, 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 and he was active in the church, and the church uh, uh, broke ties with him. And he is uh, still has not repented. And uh, I'm not even sure. That so they brought him before the whole congregation. They brought they. He would, he, he would not fail come. before that process. That he would not. Happen. He would not come in front of the congregation. <coughs> his wife came in front of the congregation, and the, and, the, and, the, and the pastor stood in his place as far as to inform the congregation that he was being. He wouldn't come himself before, but the issue was brought before the entire congregation. Okay. But this is the, where the actual person comes before the congregation. Yeah, we had that incident happen. Uh, at one church we were at, we had a, my wife was the youth group leader, and there was a boy who, uh, his, it was just him and his mother, and he was just graduating high school, and his mother died. And she was on assisted living, they lived in Section 8 housing, she had uh, uh, seizures, really bad seizures. And it was a seizure that actually ended up killing her because she had her head it face down in a pillow, and she couldn't get herself turned over, and she suffocated. And uh, so my, he had wanted my wife and I to help with the funeral arrangements. And so we were working with him. He didn't have any money. I mean, he, they had nothing. And uh, we had some folks in the church that said, yeah, well, we're going to help out. And we even had the pastor tell the, uh, the, the director of the funeral company, said, uh, we're going to take care of this. Don't worry about this. And my wife confirmed it again with, with the pastor and with the, the funeral director. So, okay. He goes back to the, the session. This was in a Presbyterian church. The session is the one who actually rules the church, uh, pretty much. And the session basically said, actually, I don't think, I, I think he never even told him, he told the session that he made that commitment. He said that we made that commitment, and my wife and I. And so it's like, well, wait a minute. No, you made the commitment, uh, so you need, we need to step up here. And so there, that began this battle of him continually telling more lies and us trying to reconcile it. So we went to him first, tried to reconcile it. It didn't work. There was another lady who was involved who then also went and spoke with him. We took that second step, and he, he acted like, no, it's, it's not my problem. I, I didn't make these commitments. And so then we went to the session, and what we did was is we wrote a letter uh, explaining everything, what happened. And, I, and we basically said, look, we're not here to try to kick him out. We're just here to try to reconcile this issue because he made a commitment and now he's saying he didn't. The, end up, the thing that ended up is we left uh, because we were considered unforgiving, hurtful, uh, condemning, all kinds of stuff. And so the session, in essence, sided with his, his side of the story and not us, even though we had you know, the funeral director and plenty of witnesses to say that, no, he, he said this. And it wasn't until years later uh, that phrase came up, wi uh, wisdom is justified over children. Uh, it wasn't until years later that people come up and said, Jeff, we realized that he lied to you and he lied to us. And that <coughs> pastor's no longer there anymore. He's gone. So it, we, we have followed that process. It didn't work <laughs> initially. Uh, it, it kind of took time to do that. But our desire at the time was, was to just get this reconciled. You know, he made a mistake, No, you know, it happens, no big deal, just reconcile it. But he was persistent in staying with that lie. 
And then he started telling other lies. So, like I say, one lie begets another, begets another, begets another. So, yeah, it's we try to follow the process, and the whole process is for the purpose of reconciliation. It's not like, let's figure out how we can get this guy out the quickest. It's, no, we want to reconcile this guy. But the funny reason that he got out, because they just wanted to get him out. There wasn't a process of reconciliation. It was just, let's get him out. We're tired of him. Let's get him. So. Have any else, else used that? Yeah, but the guy get you where he wanted you in the process. Yeah, I, I had actually <clears throat> was getting, I was getting so angry that I started talking when I shouldn't have been talking about it. So I told my wife, I said, look, this is just going to make me angry and bitter. Uh, so that's one of the reasons why we left, because we didn't want to start spreading poison in the church with our attitude. And so that's why we separated. Uh, of course, it humbled me. It showed me that we were following the process correctly and that we, we did the right thing. We separated ourselves uh, for that time. But the Lord brought it around. Like I said, it took a couple of years, but the Lord brought it around and made others realize that he was lying, he wasn't telling the truth, and that we were trying to do the best we could. So, And, and it actually did work because, because you, in the process, were trying to reconcile, but um, the right party removed themselves from the, uh, from the situation, yeah. from, from fellowship. Because because since they stood on his other side, you were the you were the right party yeah. that actually broke fellowship. So it did work. Yeah, I mean, because it just didn't work in the it just, just didn't work in the sense that that, that you would have thought that yeah break fellowship with him so much as but since they were siding with him, you were brought break fellowship with 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 them. Yeah, which actually in the end was the correct breaking of fellowship. Yeah, we when we realized that you, when the the leadership. Was not. I mean, this is once the leadership is taking that position. There's nothing we can do. You know, the only I, I can't. You know, create a grassroots movement to throw out the leaders uh, because we're supposed to give honor to our leaders. And and so rather than saying anything bad, we just left. But in the process of time, it, it worked itself out. So I was glad. I was at the time. I wasn't glad how it was going on. I was like, Lord, what's going on? This isn't right. He messed up. And then years later, the Lord actually said, you need to call and apologize to him. I thought, what for? <laughs> what did I do? He said, you, you got angry with him and you started spreading, I wasn't spreading rumors, it was gossip in the sense of I was telling the truth about him, but I was not keeping it in the, the, the method of what God had said. And so I apologized to him. And, and uh, he said, oh, brother, that's okay. It's all water under the bridge. Okay. I'm thinking, Lord, he still's not confessing his lie. He said, that's not your problem. He's my problem. You had a problem. We took care of it. We're clear. Now he's got a problem still. And he said he'll deal with it. And he did. He's gone. So, I'm sorry, Dave. Uh, the only thing we got to remember is back then, uh, the church was it. If somebody was kicked out of the church, they weren't welcome to the synagogue. They weren't welcome with the other people, and they weren't welcome back in the church. And so they really did feel ostracized from, from society. Yeah. But today, there's a church down on the next corner. Yeah, I was <laughs> like, you don't want me, I'll go over to Brother So and So. Yeah. Yeah, yeah and then they embrace him with loving arms and. So they don't know the story, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, I think, uh, but well, back to what we were saying. The Lord has his limits, and the Lord actually gives us a limit, too. He gives us a, a pattern, uh, a method that we can follow for the purpose of trying to reconcile, which is exactly what God is doing when he's long-suffering, when he's patient, when he sends in prophets and priests and, and people to come in and say, hey, you need to stop doing this, need to repent. So, same thing there. Hello. But the word flesh, uh, vasar, it can it can refer to with respect to man. It signifies corruption or an unwilling to repent. It also can actually refer to the physical flesh itself. Uh, Genesis two twenty one says, and the Lord God caused a, a deep sleep to fall upon man, and he slept and t he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. So the flesh can either refer to the physical person. 
or it can also be referred to the corrupt carnal nature. It just depends upon how it's being used in, in context. Um, it says here, yet his days shall be 120 years. And of course, my question is, what does that mean? Uh, if you read through a lot of the commentaries, uh, they say, well, he had 120, they, they limited the lifespan to 120 years. Uh, it was from the time uh, that God called Noah to start building the ark until the flood had happened was 120 years. Um, but if we examine it, or like here, here's a commentary, uh, this is the Geneva Bible translation notes. It refers to which time span God gave man to repent before he would destroy the earth. Um, have any of you studied, in studying Genesis, have you ever wondered what it was referring to the 120 years? No? Okay, just curious. <clears throat> I'm taking the position that that 120 years was the time that God had given man the opportunity to repent. Uh, and I go with 1 Peter 3.20. It says, Which sometime were disobedient when once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was a preparing wherein few, that is, eight souls, were saved by water. And that word for long suffering, many times when it talks about the long suffering of God, it refers to God willing to wait for somebody to repent. Uh, and I put down there the cross reference, Second Peter 3 9, which says, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long suffering to us, word, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Uh, so I think that it's referring to the time period that God was allowing man the opportunity one last time to repent. Because, of course, there, if you know, Enoch was the seventh from Adam, and his name means teacher. And he was known for being a man, a wise man, or a righteous man that taught righteousness, that taught repentance, and he also taught of the coming flood. Uh, so there was many generations of men preaching the word to the world at that time. And this is almost in a sense like a last ditch effort. I'm going to give you this period of time. 120 years is quite a long time. I mean, but for somebody who's living several hundred years, I don't know, I guess that might maybe like a decade to us or something. Uh, but that's still quite a bit of time. That's plenty of opportunity to repent. Uh, so God is patient. I think it's pretty clear God is patient and willing that any that no one should perish but all come to repentance. Uh, but uh, it's interesting, the book of Jasher, which is you know not a, a part of the Bible, but it's mentioned twice in the Bible, it actually said that Methuselah and Noah had preached repentance for 120 years before the flood came. So God is definitely patient, definitely willing that nobody perish and just knowing that that's one of the things that has helped me to become more and more patient with other people uh, we have a family member uh, on my wife's side who's going through some rough stuff uh, went through a divorce and and uh, she's doing some things that she shouldn't be doing and uh, I'm her other siblings are not have no patience with her whatsoever <laughs> Uh, they're just yelling and screaming and hollering at her, and so I said, "Let's let's sit her down. Let's talk with her. Let's see if we can uh, just be patient with her and help her out." Uh, one of the things that I used to not have was patience. My mo my mother always thought I would be the youngest kid to have an ulcer, when, when they thought ulcers were what caused uh, or stress caused <coughs> ulcers. The thing that I get up, you know, when I was teaching this for today, first thing I ask God for is patience. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but um, bum. He, he, he needs to hear the joke. <laughs> Write this down now. Write this. Down. Yeah. There really was the uh, the argument about predestination. Yeah, it does. Well, and it also brings up an interesting one too: is that if, if when you look at the the, the longevity of man. Um, the flood kind of draws a line in the sand between men living 900 years and all of a sudden it, it drops off to the to the hundreds um, and it, it, it begs to raise the question okay God allowed man to before the before the flood God, God had man living um, almost a thousand years and Man in general, mankind in general, uh, had, the, had the longevity of a thousand years, and a thousand years was not enough to bring some of them to repent. And yeah. so, this 120 years, um, our lifespan today is 
in that vicinity now. So it's it's like okay, God gives us our normal lifespan is the amount of time that He says is is just for us. You know, the the long suffering for us to repent in the vicinity of 120 years, and then we will die one way or the other. Not so much that we're condemned that He's not that that, that we're condemned. It's just that he's given us 120 years to, to, to repent. We'll repent. If we're going to, we will repent that time. And if we're not, then our natural life will be over um, on its own. Yeah. And we'll go to a whatever, whatever that would, you know, whatever not coming to Jesus Christ would lead us to at that point. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, I'm of the opinion that, uh, that, the history from the beginning up until now has been a demonstration to show that no matter what you give man, whether you give him a long life, a short life, you give him power, prestige, you give him nothing, you give him all kinds of rules, you give him no rules to follow, that man cannot govern himself. Man cannot stay away from sinning. No matter what you do, no matter the conditions you create, man will always sin regardless of the circumstances. Therefore, we need someone who can take away those sins. And only Christ can do that. That's my opinion of the and whole, then, whole. And, and here's, here's the lifespan you have to repent. If you yeah. don't, it's you over. And you pay for, yeah, you pay uh, with your soul separated from the Lord forever. So, yes. <coughs> Moving on, we're now at verse 4. Sweet. Uh, it says, There were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, the same became mighty men, which were of old and men of renown. Uh, I don't think you gentlemen were here with us, but this was a bone that was discovered in Turkey. Uh, it's a femur bone, and as you can tell, this would put this person about 14, 16 feet tall. Uh, so when it, the Bible says that there were giants in the earth in those days, I think that's true. you got to read the basket, basketball. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because this guy's about six foot, and that's about the location of that hand, or that's right there. That's about where his hand would be. So, but what's interesting, the word that's used there for giants uh, is the word nephilim, and that word is also used in uh, Numbers thirteen thirty three, and it says in there. We saw the giants, or Nephilim, the sons of Anak, which come of the giants, and we were in our own sight as grasshoppers, and so we were in their sight. Uh, this, of course, is when um, they had come through the wilderness after about 40 years, and they were coming up to the land of Canaan. Let's pull this back a little bit. They're coming up to the land of Canaan, and they sent the spies in, and only two of them came out with a good report. There was the 12 that went in, only two came out. Joshua and Caleb came out with a good report. And they said, we are as grasshoppers to them. Well, that could probably look like a grasshopper to you, to them. Uh, but all throughout the, New, uh, the Old Testament, when it talks about the, the, the cities in the land of Canaan, they refer to them many as being uh, inhabitants of giants. Uh, the sons of Anak were, of course, one. Uh, the Moabites called them Emims. The Ammonites had called them Zamzimims. Uh, they're also known as Rephaim. Uh, King Og was a Rephaim, and uh, some of the cities that they dwelled in was in like areas of Hebron, um, Gilead, Bashan, Argog. Uh, this whole area was littered with giants, and of course, as it says, and also after that, referring to after the flood, and that's what happened is in the land of Canaan, my guess is that Satan knew the plan that God had and was going to try to prepare the land to be ready to take out the Israelites when they entered in, when they came out of, of Israel. Because obviously the angels knew the promise that was made to Abraham that it was that this land would become an inheritance to his descendants, but they would go into a land of captivity for 400 years. And then after that they would come back out. And so Satan had set up at least seven nations in the land of Canaan and many of them were covered with giants uh, in that time. And in, What's interesting is an uh, interesting enigma. Uh, this is from Chuck Missler. He says, what does the Gulan Heights, Hebron, and the Gaza Strip have in common? 
they were the areas that Joshua failed to exterminate the Rephaim or the the giants. And if you take a look, these were the areas that they had trouble getting rid of them. Well, that looks like a very familiar map you sometimes see on the news today of these being the disputed territories. Uh, of course, Gaza Strip has already been turned back over, I believe. Uh, they want to get they're wanting they have been wanting to turn over the Gulan Heights and also this area, this red shaded area in half of Jerusalem. So it's interesting that because they didn't take care of it back then, it's still not taken care of today. That's interesting. Yes. Well, it's interesting that uh, you know if you look at this total sum of the Arab lands, <coughs> you know, with all of Saudi Arabia, Syria, you got you know Iraq, you got all of this land that the Arabs have, and it's it's the Arab brothers, you know, the Palestinians. Mm -hmm. that are in dire straits here in, in living in tents and, and, and all that sort of thing in Israel and have been for years and years and years. And if you look at the size of all that land mass compared to what Israel has, I, my question is, why, logically speaking, doesn't those, don't those other countries who are Arab brothers and Palestinians create a state or country for them you know, to basically solve the, the problem of, uh, of the Palestinian question. Yeah. Okay. Why does it have to come out of a tiny little state like Israel? Yeah. Or a little country like Israel? Why? It's the promise, I mean, it's the promise piece of it. It's, it, it's all based in the it's well, all based in the land mass. It's not based on whether you can give it and whether you can bring them here and put them in, in Texas or not. It all is it, 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 the, the, the heritage is based in the land, in the, in the in the actual in the actual dirt that they reside on, and so it it will be a it will be an issue. Yeah, but and you know you know why you're saying it because it, it was. And I I understand. My, and I agree my, with my, you, my questions were for it. Yeah, yeah, yeah right. I, but I just was, yeah. you know making a comment that it would be so easy. Yet yet never have they stepped forward. And propose such a thing. No, no. And, and not only that, but the, the very existence of Israel as an ancient people and nation in that part of the world is denied by the Muslims. Yeah. So much so that they are digging every day around the Temple Mount and, and extracting very valuable artifacts, taking them out back and bulldozing them. Yeah, they're destroying them. Get, destroying them, trying to get rid of any remnant. Of Israel, yet the the, yet the, uh, the Muslim you know archaeologists digging in there know full well what that is, yeah. but yet their their main their, their, the political line is well they weren't here. There's something that the UN did in uh, in 1948, yeah. okay. or okay. Yes. That, you know, yeah. I'm oh, sorry. See, 85 percent of the Palestinians live in Jordan, and 70 A.D. when Titus took all that. <coughs> That land remained desolate. Nobody claimed it. The nomads went back and forth through it. But nobody claimed it as a nation. So from 70 AD, the Palestine, Palestinians had the opportunity to say, we want this to be our nation. But they never did. And that was another fulfillment of God's work until Israel wanted it as their country back. Yeah. And then immediately the fight started. Yeah. But we've seen areas over there of Arabs that were friendly to the Jews, and they live in very nice towns, very beautiful houses, countryside nice. But in '48, they said, "Look." We want to live here with you. We will not fight against you. But we won't help you either because you're fighting against other Arabs. But we will not stand in your way. We want to be part of your country. Yeah. And those Arabs are being blessed today. Yeah. Yeah, they actually have a lot more rights and freedom as Israeli citizens than is in a refugee camp. Can you say Moab? Yeah. So yeah, there's uh, 
But yeah, those were the disputed territories that uh, Joshua and the others couldn't get get them expelled, and they're still that way today. And it's interesting that whenever we read in the Old Testament, we'll sometimes read that they'll go into a town and they'll just kill the men. And they'll take the women or let the women go or, or whatnot. But then in some places, they'll kill the men, the women, and even the children. Everything, and everything, else. everything else, yeah. Totally obliterated. And a lot of people wonder, why did they do, why would God kill a young child? Well, if it was infested with giants that were half men, half angelic, they're no longer human. And they're no longer uh, able for redemption. Yes? I was wondering, when this God set up Israel, why didn't he extend that over to the Mediterranean? They need a knockoff first. You know, it took... It took uh, extend what? Their country, all over. Whose country? Was that, was that the original? You talk about the red all the way around, and that's the original. Yeah. No, that's, that's the disputed territory. That's the disputed territory. I'm sorry, yeah. excuse me. Yeah, that's, that, this is where the... Uh, that's disputed. I think they call this the 1967 borders. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And then they say they need to pull back to the 1967 borders, and that that pretty much will kill them off if they did. Yeah. They Unless the Lord steps in. Eight miles to the western bank, over to the Mediterranean. Yeah, there's not much there. So I just thought that was interesting. Threw that in there. Uh, you've already seen this picture here. I just thought I'd throw it up there again, uh, describing. You can get this. There's a website called M Mount Blanco, mtblanco.com, that talks about this giant and where it came from and that sort of thing. And there, that's not the largest one. There's bigger ones out there. Uh, Steve Quayle, who has a website that talks about giants, he gives examples of different ones that have been discovered over the centuries. Uh, one of the largest ones being up to 36 feet tall. That's a big one. I think we can recruit him for the Pacers. He could just stand in the middle and. The whole line, yeah, in football. <laughs> you know, today we have people that grow to about eight foot or whatever, yeah. plus, and they have problems with their muscle standing and all that stuff. What the fuck if they had a problem? I don't know. Yeah, there's a saying that you never see. That there's a saying you never see an old giant because they die out young. But a lot of the problems that they have, it's called acromegalia. It's excessive growth hormone, and what it does is their heart can't keep up with the rest of the body, and so it basically they die for the lack of being able to oxygenate the body. Uh, but I guess if these were hybrids between human and fallen angels. What's the difference between 15 and 36? Fifteen's taller than than, all, than the others. But not, you know, not as tall as 36. Oh, and, and number B. B. Oh, where are they getting down that far in the... Uh, I think it was a timeline. Uh, oh, is that, is that, that A, B, A, B, C, D, or yeah. timeline? Yeah, B is a 15-foot human skeleton found in southeast Turkey in late 1950s in the Euphrates Valley. During road construction, many tombs containing giants were uncovered there. The, this pertains to the picture of the giant human femur and myself above. Yeah, this was, that number 15 was that previous femur you saw. Okay. Yeah. Maybe it was just the key. Is it, is it Christ himself that said that in the last days it shall be much like the days of Noah? Yeah. Um, you know, if there's all that genetic manipulation going on from the Nephilim, uh, you know, having children, uh, you know, it seems logical to, to assume that because of science and, and um, you know, genetic manipulation that we can do in a test tube, you know, yeah. that maybe we will create some sort of a super hybrid human that will be resistant to disease, to disease or maybe even be taller than the rest of us. And, uh, but actually, those, those types of experiments are going on today, yeah. where they're trying to manipulate and create a kind of a super race and a, a genetic resistance to disease and that sort of thing. Yeah. Uh, so it, it's not that far away. No. Well, in... 
if you if you, if, if you look at it this way, uh, there's there's another and, and this pops another idea into my into my mind that if um, kind of gives back a little bit to uh, the the debate that is going on between my sister and Jeff. If you go through, um, I know there are some sciences that are Christian, but but a lot of them have a have difficulty with that. Uh, uh, with reconciling science with Christian, but if, if, if they're attempting to to produce a uh, a larger race, it would bear witness to the planning of Satan that uh, he's preparing society through a long term of research, uh, preparing them so that when that race does appear, or he can, he can he can gradually bring that race into existence through the devil. That uh, society is already prepared and willing to to accept it. Yeah. Um, I mean, we already see that. Uh, we hold. Uh, you're saying, whether you're saying it would be. If this is a river George, bring up the Nephilim, but because of the scientific research, would accept them. As we already some sort of a test to experiment or something, right? Well, well, we, 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 it would be an easy, easy uh, uh, transition from the test to to um, to reality. I mean, we're already we're already uh, holding um, quote unquote giants, uh, of modern giants, in high esteem through through sports. And so, with the test tube and with, with science doing this research, um, whether you could attribute it to science or not, if they, if, as, as, as the stature of, of humanity increases, whether it's actually through the testing or not, society is being prepared for the acceptance of a larger than current stature of, of a race uh, it, society will accept it. I mean, especially if it comes in and is introduced through the sports. Um, it might be true. If, I mean, people already look at, at uh, uh, what's what is the what is the most popular, highest expenditure of of our country is 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 supporting uh, supporting the sports that that are. Played by larger and stronger humans than the general population, and we breed that through our school systems. It's uh, our children as they grow; the ones of a, of a larger stature um, play sports with the expectations of being uh, a star in, in college, and then they play uh, in college with the expectations. Because and it's it's popular, it draws draws uh, large crowds. They are uh, almost worshipped by the general public, and they, they move on and on and on up into the professional, and they're totally accepted. Yeah. Well, but, but you can't condemn someone because they're tall. No, and I'm not condemning that. I'm just saying that that, that this is this is preparing society as an accepted force, uh, as as something that will be accepted uh, in the future. But you got to, you know, person, I, I don't judge a person by size. I judge, judge a person by their personality and what they have inside. And I think if you have a giant, that, that's fantastic. As long as they're Christian, there's no big deal with that. Well, I, I don't think. All i got to say is if the players were bigger, I would be able to sit in the nosebleed section and be able to see them. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> that's true. But do you see where I'm going with that? Society is being... Yeah. Society is being <laughs> Uh, rude to accept. They do that with gasoline. A larger rate. You start off, and they, they, they raise it up to four, uh, $3, then they bring it back down. Then they raise it up to $3.10, then they bring it back down. It's, it's just the way, way you uh, condition people to accept things. And I see your point. I think you're I, tired. I have no problem with giants. Unless it's a skate here. Giants. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> if, you've ever, if you've ever been around, this is interesting because not many people did what I did last year. I got to do the national anthem for the Patriots. I walked out right when they were warming up to get set. I talked.
talking about feeling like a grasshopper. Yeah. These guys are so, and I'm, I'm six feet tall. Okay, these guys make me feel like one of these guys was standing next to me. But that's, and that's how, you know, that's how the, the, the difference was. That's yeah. fine, as long as no one goes around you, I have no problem. <laughs> 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 yeah, I know, I know. Yes. They actually found bones for that 36 foot. Yeah. Uh, that's what they see. came up with. One, one bone, right? Well, let me look. The 36 one, uh, this one goes back to uh, 36 foot. This is Carthaginians somewhere between 200 and 600 BC. It was something that was recorded uh, in some ancient textbook. I'd have to look more. Uh, you can you can check it here. I don't I don't know if it's with us today. Uh, well, they don't have the bones. Not not today. But uh, but when you read, like I was reading in Josephus last night, and uh, he was talking about there were various areas where they still where giants existed and they still had the bones, and they were on display in the temple at that location. So uh, you could still go and see those things. Of course, when King Og had died. Uh, they they kept his bed and they kept it somewhere where if you wanted to you could actually go and see it, which was 13 feet long and six feet wide. I can't remember the cubits, but it, but you could go see that stuff. Yes. I taught social studies along with everything else I taught, and one of the best books I ever got on ancient, uh, not ancient but uh, Jewish religion was Josephus. Josephus. Yeah. Now you got to be very careful. Yeah. Because he's he's writing it because of the Romans, but still it's a good book. Yep, yep. And again, you can download it for your eSword, and it's a resource book. You can get the, the Wars of the Jews and the Antiquities of the Jews. And I was reading through the Antiquities of the Jews when it talked about the flood, and, and he was mentioning the giants and that the bones were on display still. If you wanted to go see him, you could go see him. And actually, it was a glorious thing to hunt a giant, you know, because if you could take down the giant, you were an awesome man. Yeah, well, like I, I was going to say that's that's where I was going. Was that was the most popular or yeah. most known giant was Goliath, and there's there's uh, quite a bit of description as far as his size and his height and yeah. his that's abilities that's and his strength. He had six fingers on each hand and six that toes on each foot. Mm -hmm. That was because of David, but I mean, that, that, so, so he was recorded in history. That was uh, quite in, in probably more detail than than any other person that I can think of that wasn't directly involved with Say that Jesus. again. What was that again? I'm sorry. The details of the details of Goliath are recorded probably in more detail as far as his personal stature than any other than any other Well they're uh, trying to glorify David. Well understood. But, yeah. but everything is in the Bible for a reason. Yeah, I mean they recorded the size of Goliath. They also recorded the size of uh, of uh, King Og. Right, bad. but, but, yeah, but no other, no, nobody mm -hmm. else was really. There was no description of uh, of the physical features, particularly of, of of practically any other. I mean, maybe Saul. Yeah, yeah, they, yeah, they, yeah, a little not, bit. Not, not the height thing, but it was tall. He's yeah. used yeah. uh, yeah. heads above the others. Mm -hmm. So yeah. And so so it's in, it, because those those yeah. things are in the Bible. Yeah. Though. God does yeah. those yeah. for a reason. Yeah. And brings those. <coughs> I mean, yeah. the, 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 he only brings minute detail when it's really important yeah. Yeah. for a, whether yeah. it's to, to to lead you to search for him or not. But that's what's well, interesting when David picked up, like you're talking about my new details. When uh, David had picked up stones, it said he picked up five. Mm -hmm. And critics have said, well, apparently he didn't have much faith in his God because he he should have just picked up one. Well, we find out in the scriptures that Goliath had four other brothers. Mm -hmm. So he was anticipating the possibility of retribution. Mm -hmm. So he was prepared for all five. Yeah. But he has so much of son. Okay, I have a son of the same height as I am, six eight. But then my other son, his younger brother, is only five eight. Yeah. You know, my parents, my dad was five eight, my mom's only five four. Yeah. So Goliath's brothers could have been smaller. Could have been. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We're not sure. But that's uh, that's one of the speculations is that he was of a they were all of a large well I have to look at it maybe I can't remember if it says if they were all of the large stature I know that there's several places where it referred to the giants and talking about their large stature but not giving specific details uh, but I know that uh, after someone like reading through Josephus he acknowledges the fact that many of them were 
of a very large stature, and that's why they felt like grasshoppers in their sight, because you know, if you had something like this, or something like this, or heck, even something like this. Well, we're, we're, kind, we're kind of saying, too, that back then all people were our size. They were smaller. Everyone was smaller. Uh, I think five foot six was, was probably the average height of people living back in that time, yeah. in that area. Yeah. But the... Which is not small, but... It's yeah. Small. But the point is is that there were giants and there's st there is still evidence around or there's evidence that's recorded that these guys were around and there's some that think that they still food. exist today they have a better food supply more vegetables yeah yeah animals people yeah, <laughs> yeah there was a tale uh i was reading in that book called the uh, disneyland of the gods it said that the indians here in america said that a giant could run alongside a buffalo pick one up with one arm, yank its leg off with the other, and eat it and still keep running. They said they were that big in the land. And in, and in America. In the Americas, and also in South America. Now these are tales, of course, you know, from tales passed down over centuries as but to I, the giants I, I in the land. I think that the Indians came down from Siberia, Siberia until much later than that. They, they just, I mean, there's, there's, there's a lot of history that's here that we just don't really talk about too much. Yeah, DNA has opened that up a lot. Yeah. Because more of us have been trying to prove that we're Mormon when we got DNA. They said, now we can really do it. Because we got DNA from the Indians. Yeah. Yeah. They were the first ones to find out that they were Mormons. Yeah. And they said, well, we don't have to Yeah, there was a there was some pretty. I mean, there's a lot of there's one book I haven't read it, but it talks about the American ruins, and it talks about the various mounds and even pyramids that exist here in America, just like in South America, just like in the Middle East, just like in China, in Europe. Uh, that there was a thriving community here at one time uh, before the Europeans came over, uh, and I think, but under under. I heard Glenn Beck talking about this once, that under what they call Manifest Destiny, uh, they believe that the Indians here were savages, and so therefore there was no problem in killing them when we came over here, and there's no problem in taking over their territories. That's what he says. Uh, so there, is, there was an, a, a population here for quite some time, and it's that population that these stories come out of, that you know, many moons ago, there was. They're talking about them coming over, coming down from Siberia about ten thousand years ago. But that's still up for grabs. Yeah, that's still up for grabs. But I mean, some of those stories I take tongue in cheek because I just don't know. But I look at them because they they do make they do bear witness to what the Bible talks about. And so this idea that the whole earth was corrupt, and there's these stories that before and after the flood there were giants in the land. So I, I kind of accept that, yeah, that's possible, because the Bible supports it, not because the other book says it. Uh, but moving on here, we're getting close to our... Oh, good, i got two more slides, and then we can call it a night, day, I mean. Uh, this word giant, the word underneath it is Nephilim. And uh, there's a couple of different dispute over the word itself. Does it mean giants, or does it mean fallen ones? Uh, Chuck Missler who I use a lot of his material, uh, he contends that it comes from the root word nephal, which means to fall, be cast down, to fall away, or desert. Uh, in the Septuagint, it uses the word gigantis, which is the same word translated as titans. Uh, also, there are other non-Christian sources. You may have heard of this guy before, Zachariah Sitchin. He's not a Christian. Uh, that's his website right there. I think he's already passed away. But he's written a series of books called The Earth Chronicles, and he believes that the Nephilim our ancient astronauts fallen down from heaven. Uh, Sitchin says that the sons of God are the Nephilim, but the Bible, of course, says that they were the offspring of the sons of God and the daughters of men. But his theory, along with Eric von Donegan and uh, you know the chariots of the gods, uh, believe that this passage is talking about extraterrestrials that came from another planet that came down, and because they were of an advanced race, uh, I think even Carl Sagan had said that any society that is confronted with uh, another society of higher technology, they would assume them to be gods. And so they said, well, 
those weren't gods back then. Those weren't angels. Those were aliens. And they came down and they taught them all kinds of advanced technology and things. And then they left. And the history does show that there was sort of this boom of knowledge in astronomy, knowledge in geometry, knowledge in math. Uh, they find that among the Sumerians and so forth. And, like, and if you read the, the book of Enoch, it does mention that uh, they taught the people various things that God had not intended to be taught. Um, and even the, like Arrhenius and Polycarp and even Josephus makes mention that they had taught things to men that they were not supposed to know. But Zachariah Sitchin takes the standpoint that the, the word there, Nephal, mean, Nephilim, means the fallen ones, means they came down from heaven and taught men. But, uh, I'm sorry, David, you had your hand up? Uh, okay, there. But when uh, some people are going into that theory is in that area of uh, South America that the only way you can see the patterns that are drawn in the ground is to be in an airplane because the patterns themselves are so huge that yet once you get up in the air you see nothing. Uh, yeah, the Nazca patterns. lines of Peru. Yeah. And I think the most amazing thing about those 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 areas is that society was just cut off. Their, 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 yeah. the, the timeline it's almost it's almost just like one year it was here and the next year it was gone. Uh, yeah, there's it, just, a, it didn't it didn't have any survivors over any length of time. It's just like it sprouted up. It was it prospered and then poof, it was gone. Yeah. And there's a, there's a tribe in Africa called the Dogon tribe, and they, for centuries, had talked about that the dog star Sirius was a binary star. And uh, for the longest time, we thought, no, that's not true. It's, it's a single star. Well, until we got more advanced telescopes, we were able to see that, yes, it was a binary star. And so they're, off, they're asking the question, how did they know that that was a binary star? And they actually, they knew a whole bunch of information about the stars that we did not know until recently with the Hubble Space Telescope and some other things. And they, the tribe says, well, their people who had come down from the stars came from the dog star Sirius, came down to them and taught them things that man did not know at that time and enlightened their, their people, and that's, they carry on those traditions. Which again, that testimony fits with what we find in the book of Enoch uh, and even in pieces and places in the Bible about angels teaching men things that they were not supposed to know. Uh, teaching the art of war, uh, teaching the art of conjuring certain things, just stuff we weren't supposed to know. Yes? There's a real quick side thought. Fallen angels doesn't mean they can't fly, right? <laughs> uh, I don't know. Well, they may not have clearance. I think what I'm saying is, is if you're going to build a monument to your <clears throat> God uh -huh. and do it so that it pleases them and they can see it and nobody else can, you would you would then try to make uh, some sort of a thing on the ground that you want to see it in the air. Because yeah. they could go to and fro where their where humanity could. Yeah. That's a good point. Uh, but there's another viewpoint. This word does just mean giants. Uh, and I got this one from Michael Heiser. Uh, he said it comes from an Aramaic root, nafil. Uh, Michael, he has a PhD from, uh, in, Hebrew, in the Hebrew Bible and ancient Semitic languages. He worked for a time at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, and now he's an academic editor for Logos Bible Software. And I've actually been in contact with him by email, uh, because as I read through the, the Antonician Fathers, I'm I'm finding references that I'm then giving to him and he's using that for his to add to his research material because he also talks about the fallen angels he talks about um, just a whole slew of things and so I'm running across references that he hadn't run across before and he's saying yeah send me more but his website uh, if you want to read it is his, uh, that talks about the Nephilim is this michaelheiser.com uh, he also has another website called SitchinIsWrong.com uh, and he Sitchin is is a Jew and he speaks he reads Hebrew but uh, Michael Heiser says he doesn't read it properly <laughs> so he put that website up and he also has a book called The Facade uh, it's one of these books they call them faction books it's fact cloaked in fiction uh, and it's a really good read 
Uh, I can't say I agree with every point he makes, but uh, you can get it as an ebook. Funny thing, I can tell how my mind's going. I, I, I got the book again just recently and started reading it, and I thought, man, I have read this before. And I got it in an e form or an e reader. I thought, wait a minute. So I searched my computer and I found the same book from 2007. So I bought it twice. <laughs> so if anybody wants a copy, I can I can technically send it to you without violating the copyright. Uh, but it's an interesting book. I read it in a couple of days. I'm a slow reader too, so it was a good book. Uh, but he takes that position that the word doesn't mean fallen one; it just means giants, and he gives these as reasons. Uh, all the other ancient Jewish texts from the intertestimonial period. They refer to this uh, part of Genesis, uh, have the Nephilim as giants and not fallen ones. He says it also explains why all Jewish and earlier Christian commentators prior to Augustine took the literal view of Genesis 6, 1 through 4, angelic human cohabitation that produced giants. Uh, and also, the, the word can also refer to a species of lizard, which is interesting. If you get into UFO lore, uh, that's a good place to stop, because that's the next section. Wow, took what four weeks to go through four verses. That's awesome. First week. <laughs> <laughs> Something like that. Any questions? Any comments? Good. Good, good, good. You know what? I don't think we even started in prayer, did we? I just now realized that. Did you even turn your mic on? Yeah, I turned that on. I saw the countdown, but I forgot to open us up in prayer. So, so you can close it. I, I can I can close this. I've done a lot of talking, I'll keep talking more. <laughs> Dear Heavenly Father, once again, thank you so much uh, for bringing us together to study in your word and to learn more and to grow deeply in your word. And I so very much appreciate uh, these men. Uh, I appreciate their knowledge. I appreciate their comments. And Lord, I thank you that you have filled them with the Holy Spirit, filled them with your word, to fill them also with, with understanding that I don't have, uh, that we can come together and we can be as iron sharpening iron. Uh, I really do enjoy this time that we have together. I wish it could last longer, uh, but of course they only give us so much time. But Lord, I pray that you would uh, send them off, uh, have a good week, uh, a good time of study, a good time of prayer, and bring us all back together again, Lord, so that we can just dig in further and learn more about you, not so that we can just have the knowledge of you, but so that we can also put it into practice and walk in obedience and righteousness. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Thanks, I get, guys. I get, I, get some, I get some documentation that you talked about gas prices. Uh, there is... Uh